Hello, and welcome to the Agnext podcast. We're always excited to tell you about what's next from Agnext. I'm one of your hosts, Jen Rieskamp. Most folks call me JR, and I'm here with my other co-host. Pedro Carvalho. All right, and we are excited. Today, we have uh, Associate Professor and Dairy System Specialist, Dr. Jason Lombard, with us on the podcast today. Let's get into it. Hi, Jason. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me today. Excited to... To talk to you guys today. That's awesome. We are excited to hear all about what you're doing at Ag Next as an associate professor and dairy system specialist. So where should we start, Pedro? Yeah. So Jason, we always like to start asking our uh, guests to talk about their background. So could you just start where, where you went to school and you get your DVM left and then came back to, to academia now? Can you? Sure. Spend as much that. time as you want to. <laughs> so, yeah, I started, I uh, came to CSU in 1985, so a few years ago, and um, always had my mind set on becoming a veterinarian. And so I started in my degree in animal sciences, which I never quite finished. I got a bachelor's in veterinary sciences just because there were some additional credits that needed to be done to get into vet school. So, um, Received that in 1989 from CSU and then went on to veterinary school, graduated in 1993. And at that time, I uh, kind of toyed with doing a master's in epidemiology. I really like numbers. and uh, But as I looked at the financial uh, implications <laughs> of, mm-hmm. of continuing with the, the little bit of debt we had now, or had then compared to what students have now, decided mm-hmm. to go out and, and practice. So I uh, moved to Wisconsin. We spent about 10 years out there in a mixed animal, primarily dairy practice. And then in, in uh, around 2000, I started getting a little um, itchy. We had a couple kids, a couple daughters, and mm-hmm. all the grandparents were back here in Colorado. And we thought, you know, it's probably time to migrate back to some, some better weather. Mm-hmm. And so in 2002, we moved back to Colorado, and I started my master's degree at CSU. Mm-hmm. And uh, through Dr. Frank Gary, I was able to get, get – um, on board with the USDA's National Animal Health Monitoring Systems oh, Dairy cool. Studies. And so I was uh, did my master's looking at Yoni's disease in the, the 2002 dairy study. Oh, wow. Finished that in 2004 and then uh, woke up one morning and realized I worked for the federal government, which is something I never would have guessed as I was going through veterinary school. And I spent 20 years there and then just last October decided to to change course in a little bit in my career and moved over to CSU and Ag Next. That's pretty cool. Jason, like, it's it's fascinating that you spent 10 years in the industry and then decided to come back to academia. How how was that decision? Why why did you come back to, like, how was leaving a, a real job then coming back to academia? Oh, that's a good question. So um, when I was in, when I came back, when I came to CSU, when I first came to CSU, I started working at CSU Dairy, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. At, at that point, um, there was a lot of things that, and I probably remember it was the, the feeder at that time, but worked into to doing a lot of the herdsmen, the vet-related activities. We had mm-hmm. a good relationship with the, the veterinary school and, and a lot of the professors there, and so I learned a lot of the things, mm-hmm. uh, even working at the dairy that then I kind of cemented in when I was in veterinary school, and when I was in practice, most of the dairies in Wisconsin were relatively small, so mm-hmm. we probably didn't have 10% of our, pra- of our practice were dairies over 200, 300 cows. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. And so a lot of the things that, that I was doing was, was repetitive, right? Mm-hmm. And I also realized that a lot of my colleagues had spent a lot of time palpating cows, which is one of the biggest things that, that we did in dairy practice back then. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the body tends to go after a period of time. So I think with my interest in, in epidemiology and, and mm-hmm. getting more into to disease prevention and, and evaluating disease that um, and doing the same thing over and over, there's only so many times that at four in the morning you get a call for a, a milk fever case and it's 10 mm-hmm. below out and you get excited yeah. about that. Yeah, of you course. Know, <laughs> the, the excitement wanes pretty quickly. So yeah. uh, that and then the pull back to the family in Colorado really mm-hmm. – uh, just made that, made that a And, and you reality. came back thinking you would be working with research for the rest, let's say, for, of your career, or you just say, let's, let's do this master and see what's going to happen? Yeah, I don't think I had any real 
uh, preconceived notions about what I would be doing, although I would tell you that I had no plans on working for, for USDA at the time. Mm-hmm. But it did work out, and it was, it was actually a great, great experience. Um, cool. So uh, you have, have to... Watch. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, I'm curious. So I want to know about kind of your background in agriculture. Mm-hmm. Like, what did you just kind of wake up and you're like, oh, I want to work with with dairy animals or dairy cows? What kind of what's your process? How did you? Yeah, what's your background with agriculture? I'm just I'm very curious. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, well, from from wanting to be a veterinarian, actually, from our my kindergarten book. You know, you got your book that has all your pages mm-hmm. in it as you mm-hmm. go through school, what do I want to be? I put veterinarian. I don't oh, really wow. know okay. necessarily why I knew at that young of an age mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. what what really motivated me. But um, my extended family was pretty heavily involved in the beef industry. Oh, okay. Uh, so my uncle had registered Herefords. He mm-hmm. ran stalkers. He had an auction market in southwest Colorado. Cool. Uh, my grandparents had slaughter, a couple slaughter small slaughterhouses mm-hmm. and um, meat markets. Okay. Um, so I was kind of exposed to that a lot when I was growing up and, uh, but the, the retail side was pretty much gone by the time I mm-hmm. was old enough to be of any, any help. Mm-hmm. Sure. So I spent most of my summers or spent most of the time on, on a ranch in the summers helping with, with either the stalkers or the beef or the beef registered, cattle. registered Herefords and, awesome. you know, doing all the things you do on a ranch from mm-hmm. fixing fence and irrigating and mm-hmm. managing cattle. So that's where I, where I kind of, uh, focused on, well, I want to work with cattle. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to high school and, and went to work for the local veterinarian, uh, we got to do equine, small animal, cool. beef cow calf, beef feed lot, and dairy. Oh, cool. And that was really, I think, what opened my eyes to dairy in terms of mm-hmm. just a lot more uh, on farm time mm-hmm. and of doing more variety of, of things. And so that's mm-hmm. where I really got interested in, in dairy. And uh, we were working for a local dairy that that was selling out. And so I bought two, two cows and started raising nurse cows from the local feedlot. So That's I did awesome. that through high school and then my parents didn't want to continue that. So, I, <laughs> so we sold those and then that That's helped fair. pay for my, for my CSU education. So oh, that was really cool. That's kind of where that started. And then, um, when I came to CSU, I started working at CSU dairy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, um, that unfortunately closed, I believe in 1989 and I bought a cow from CSU Dairy. Oh, <laughs> and uh, I was fortunate enough to, to work with who was the manager of, of the dairy at the time, Bill Wales, and he had his own dairy. Um, and so from 1989 through 93, I actually worked for Bill on Iroquois Holsteins and took my cow from CSU Dairy with <laughs> me to, to his dairy. And then he, he continued to manage my cows. And so by the time I came back in 2002, I believe I had about 20, 25 head of cows. That's awesome. And um, I had to sell those to come back to take the, <laughs> take the cut in pay to yeah. come back to graduate school. Yeah. Livestock, but, that's but what it, they call it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, so uh, livestock has really been integral in getting me, you know, into, uh-huh. into college, helping pay for college, helping pay for yeah. my undergraduate, for my master's degree. And um, actually 20 years with the Department of Agriculture, all my, all my salaries come from agriculture and it's fascinating. Most of my career. So that's cool. That's pretty interesting. And in, in, in agriculture, what are the fields that you have more interesting in agriculture and sustainability? What are, what are the fields that you like more and you've been working more, I would say? So just from the training and my interest and in animal health is really my primary mm-hmm. focus in all that. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, as, as Agnex is focused on sustainability, I kind of think of sustainability as a, as a cycle of starting with healthy animals Mm -hmm. that then are able to produce safe and nutritious products for consumers. And then if the consumers are willing to pay the price that that affords producers to keep producing the food, Mm -hmm. then we have that cycle. And so for me, Mm -hmm. that's kind of what sustainability is in a, in a nutshell, in a cycle. And I know it's really complex and, and a lot more than that. But my focus is really on the animal health side. How do we start with that? And then how do we get through to, to making a, a living for the producer, essentially? Mm-hmm. So then that leads us to the, the famous questions, right, JR? Yes. <laughs> how do you define sustainability? <laughs> well, I think part of that does define it in terms mm-hmm. of, of that whole cycle. But yep. I, I realize, you know, that we've got the environmental impacts. And I, mm-hmm. and I think that 
that as we talk about consumers willing to pay mm -hmm. for that, then they take those types of, of issues hopefully into account in, in what we can pay, what, what can producers afford to do in terms of mm -hmm. animal health, animal welfare, environmental concerns, and I think continue to try to make that cycle as efficient Mm -hmm. uh, as possible in terms of our resources yep. that we use. We talk about efficiency a lot on the podcast and sustainability. Yeah. And how can you keep that for the next generations? Right. And, think and about we all like side. to eat. Yes. Right. Yes. So, and <laughs> I like I, and need. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right. So we, we, we need to make sure that's a focus. No, that that's great. And, uh, on that focus on sustainability and also your, you mentioned a little bit on, on the health side, are there any, major projects that you're currently involved here uh, at uh, with Agnex and, and CSU. <clears throat> you presented some of your projects the other day in a general seminar for our department. Uh, what, are, what are some of the projects that you, you've been involved? So I was involved in quite a few things at USDA, um, and I, I'm hoping to carry a lot of that over into the CSU and the, the Agnex arena. The... Um, I think my main focus with animal health is primarily on young stock and Pedro, you and mm -hmm. I have definitely have some uh, interests in terms of colostrum management yep. and keeping calves healthy and, and Dr. Diego Manriquez as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for collaboration on, on that front mm -hmm. and not just the colostrum piece, but keeping, keeping those young animals healthy is, is critical and, and it's a challenge for a lot of producers. I've been here four months and I've already had, uh, two producers that we're working with on pre-weaned calf challenges. And so I, I think that's that's a, a big need for for the industry. Yeah. Um, for for those listeners who don't know, uh, and we we've talked a little bit about these things in our podcast, but Jason is another person that I was very excited to meet when I when I first came to to CSU because. When I started breeding about colostrum and those things, Jason has one of the, I would say at least recently, to my knowledge, one of the nicest research investigations that he did with oh, cool. USDA, investigating levels of total seroprotein and IgG levels. So it was I was pretty excited to come here and work with Jason in that that aspect as well. That that paper is is remarkable, right? Jason liked it. That that uh, was a great. Um a great opportunity we had. So uh, just a little background on that. In, in 2014, we did a, a National Animal Health Monitoring Systems Dairy Study, and we followed about 2,500 pre-weaned calves from birth to weaning. We tried to record everything we could about what happened to them during that time frame. Mm -hmm. And when, when we, before we started that study, I was always trying to collaborate with people and try to figure out, well, what's, what do we need to ask? What are the questions? What's the data that we need to to capture. And so I had, I had a really good core group of people that we worked with in order to get that study put together and, and um, conducted. But when we got done, there were some questions about, well, can we do better in mm -hmm. terms of passive immunity? And, and the industry at that time had, had a, a single cutoff of 10 grams per deciliter uh, of serum IgG or about 5.2 grams per liter of, of total Just, protein. Mm -hmm. And so as we talked about uh, with our within our core group, how do we how do we come to to new consensus guidelines on passive immunity? And the first thing we we did is well, who else are the experts in the in the field in the U.S. and even in Canada that we can reach out to and and have provide input? And so I think um, you know one of the things that I've learned is collaboration is is can be pretty amazing. And so ultimately we had 18 people that we had group in a group that we discussed all the data from the 2014 study that we put together and then additional papers that were available in the literature. And it took a little bit of time, but it was amazing how um, I was a little bit intimidated when I started this process. I've got all these experts and I'm just a, I'm just a dairy guy that, you know, is trying to run a study and, <laughs> and do some things. But, um, you know, I was, I was pleasantly surprised about how willing everybody was to share their, their viewpoints and, and I think that that was a, a, a great example of what collaboration can can mm. culminate in, which is I think it's really pushed the dairy industry forward in terms of animal health, animal welfare, and and uh, you know I'd like to know what the adoption of that is, and we're we're going to look into some 
some data that we have access to that may give us an idea of, of our producers. We, we hear anecdotal reports, but yeah. our producers really aim adopting this and using it. And is it having an impact on calf health, which is our ultimate goal? Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I was thinking about, you know, when you all were talking about the paper that you wrote in 2014 or the, the study that you worked on, um, it sounds like you've had a very successful career even before coming to, to CSU. So I'm kind of curious to hear about what are you hoping to accomplish in the next five years, uh, you know, four or five years here at Ag Next and, and with CSU already coming from that amazing foundation that you've built? That's a really good question. And <laughs> being four months in, it's yeah. <laughs> it's kind of daunting about where yeah. do I want to be in five years? Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, it kind of goes back to, for me, it, it goes back to my practical background and being a practitioner and solving problems on a daily basis. Uh, can we improve, let's say, calf health in on Colorado cattle operations over the next five years? Can mm-hmm. we reduce the incidence of inf- some infectious diseases? And can we show some kind of um, increase in product, producer productivity over mm-hmm. that time? So I think that's that's kind of the goal is is from me, and I, I obviously take, mm-hmm. <laughs> take guidance from my peers and my leadership. Mm-hmm. But I think when producers reach out with problems, how do we address those because I think that mm-hmm. that's that's the most important way that CSU can engage with producers is listening to what concerns they have and addressing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, it's part of the land grant mission, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's core to what we do. Yeah. So in five years, I hope we can look back and say, we've had an impact on yeah. calf health. We've had an impact on sustainability in the state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we'll continue to, to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. So in when you're talking about your your future goals and and you have an appointment that's split between let's say Agnex and the clinical science as well. Can you just tell us a little bit about your roles in each each one of those appointments? And I have kind of I'm curious to what made you move back or move to academia? Is is, is there any one of those roles that excites you more that made you say okay I I really want to go back and work for CSU or something like that? That's a good question, and and Dr. Frank Gary, who's in the College of Vet Med and Biomedical Sciences, mm-hmm. he's actually the one that that said, you know, because we we've worked together for a long time. He was actually mm-hmm. on my uh, master's committee, and and actually was a student hourly of his when I was in vet school. So we go back a long way, and he um, he reached out and said, you know, I think we have a position at CSU you you would you would like, and you would fit well into this position, and um, I said, but. Frank, I really enjoy what I'm doing, and, you know, I'm pretty stable. I've been here for a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think about uh, 15 minutes before the deadline for that <laughs> for that <laughs> announcement, I submitted my application, and, and I went through the, uh, the interview, and, and luckily I was, I was offered the position. I think that um, one of the things, as you mentioned, that, that interests me in that was the research aspect. I think when I was at USDA, uh, and it kind of goes back to – you know, the passive immunity paper or other mm-hmm. things. In, in 2014, we had a, a vesicular stomatitis outbreak in horses in Colorado, and mm-hmm. our group helped do a lot of the field work in, that, in terms of that. And we started asking questions, especially when our own horses got sick. Why are we seeing mm-hmm. some horses with disease and not? And so we ended up making, turning that into a study um, and publishing that. And so I, um, I was frequently told VS, Veterinary Services, part mm-hmm. of USDA, is not a research organization. And, but... You know, there was some some leeway in doing that. Mm-hmm. But Did you I think, figure out what was wrong with the horses? Well, vesicular stomatitis is a, a disease that's transmitted by uh-huh. biting insects. And, oh, and so one of the okay. things that we did find is that, that um, the, the pasture animals, mm-hmm. the ones that were out on pasture that maybe weren't getting fly spray or, or they didn't have fly control in the barn mm-hmm. were more likely to get exposed. Okay, that makes sense. Versus horses that were indoors. And we base that on looking at antibody titers in those horses. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was a, I think a, you know, it was kind of a neat study to put together. Yeah, that is uh-huh. cool. And um, anytime we're doing something like that, if we have an opportunity to learn something, I feel like we should take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the CSU afforded me that opportunity to, to do a little bit more research. And, and um, I was pretty nervous about 
working both in the College of Vet Med and Biomedical Sciences and Ag Next and what that mm-hmm. looked like in terms of, of kind of, you know, what my tasks were in each one. But um, my appointment, uh, I've got about a third of my appointment is teaching. Mm-hmm. And that'll primarily occur, I think, within the College of Vet Med. Yeah. And okay. so the research and outreach component of that, I think, really meshes well with College of Vet Med and, and Ag Next. And, and a part of my role is, I think, to bring groups together uh-huh. and work together to solve problems. So working with clinicians and researchers at the veterinary teaching hospital and within Agnext and with animal science, I think is, is um, part of that dual position role. And so I look, I look forward to that. I like challenges and uh, CSU. I'm, I feel like has taken a step back in terms of working with, with some of our, um, the cattle industry in some mm-hmm. aspects. And so I'm hoping that, uh, and that's primarily through, through the loss of yep. some integral leaders like Bill Wales, mm-hmm. um, hopefully we can kind of bring that that communication and cooperation sure. back to to CSU mm-hmm. as well as the, the 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 teaching that you have. I think it's it's going to be great for students to have this prat- practical view into the classroom. I think even our students here at Agnex, we from what I've been talking, the classes that you're planning to teach, like more data analysis and those things, I think that's that's going to be super helpful for, for our students as well, animal science and vet students as well, I think. So that will be that will be great. So kind of building off of your um, the research topics that we've been talking about, if you could answer one research question, what would it be and why? Any any research question. <laughs> We'll pretend that, like there's no inputs, money doesn't matter, whatever, right? <laughs> Try to throw logic yeah. out. Just what would wow. you want to answer? So that's that kind of brings up uh, a couple different thoughts. Uh, one is a, a kind of an off topic. It's something I've worked on a lot while I was at USDA that I don't have an answer to, but it's mm-hmm. not really as pertinent to what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. But maybe I'll throw it out there. Because sure. What the Great. heck? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I worked on, at USDA was bovine tuberculosis. Mm-hmm. And what we found in some cases was we had uh, our dairy workers transmitting the bacteria to our cattle population. Mm-hmm. And we've had we've had multiple other instances where we believe that's the case, but we really don't have a good, good route of transmission. Mm-hmm. And so there's been reports in the literature of, of human to cattle tuberculosis through urine, through mm-hmm. uh, primarily through urine, but it's mm-hmm. never really been um, confirmed through good laboratory techniques. So we have we have a, uh, a sequence of Mycobacterium bovis, the cause of aging of bovine tuberculosis in a, oh, wow. in a human urine sample, and we found it in our cattle population. Um, so I think that is one research question that's kind of been Interesting. gnawing at me just a little bit. And um, we also know that that can be transmitted through feces, and so do we have fecal contamination of feed for cattle, for instance? Mm-hmm. We know that that does occur because of some of the other diseases. Could that be a mode of transmission of bovine tuberculosis? Interesting. So those are kind of interesting ones. But yeah. um, I think the the other one that I think is more pertinent to what we're talking uh-huh, about sure. probably gets back to calf health. Okay, and how sure. can we how can we really improve calf health? What are the main determinants of disease that, that we can address mm-hmm. through management? Because... We can always improve our management, and I'm focused primarily on dairy cattle. But, um, and the the benefit of that is, is we have the beef side, and uh, wild ruminants that we can look, look to as mm-hmm. models of mm-hmm. let's get as close to, to mimicking what we see in beef cattle or other other ruminant species. So I think that's that's a probably a more realistic hypothesis for the position mm-hmm. I'm in now, and and what mm-hmm. maybe we could we could work on yeah and and we've we've chatted a lot about use your dairy work and how would that apply to beef as well and vice versa i think that's that's great on on the things that you know today jason i always we always this ask, is a good question we always ask this question and you can answer this uh on the research side on the personal side the professional side both <laughs> what is something that you you know today that you wish you knew 10 years ago Oh, there's a lot of things that I wish I knew t- <laughs> 10 yeah. years ago, right? Um, I think the the biggest 
lesson professionally that I've learned is collaboration. Mm -hmm. I really think that um, that is how we how we move forward is getting a lot of really smart people together and mm -hmm. coming up with a plan for a research project, for example, mm -hmm. and then carrying that out. Um, I know the university system is a little bit. It's a, it's a little bit at odds with the collaboration aspect yeah. because we all have to, you know, we're all, even me, junior faculty, right? Yeah. So we have to we have to prove ourselves. We have to get through the tenure process. But I, as I look at some of the grants that are being, um, uh, you know, available for us, mm -hmm. they really focused on multi institutional grants and mm -hmm. really getting people to to work together to to solve problems and and so I think. Hopefully the the concern I have about egos and things getting getting in the way is is hopefully not not going to be an issue. No, and you, and you are not the first person to answer this question this way. I think even our last guest, Greg Doma, mentioned the same thing. Like mm -hmm. collaboration and working as a team is is crucial. So I think that's for me, like a younger scientist, is it's. it's great to hear that because that's that's really important for us you know uh that and, and now we work as a team that's a, mm -hmm. like uh, we are sitting in a place that's perfect for that right, right. especially for myself we started my career hearing that collaboration is key and having a team to collaborate that's that's pretty nice and for i think myself. yeah and i think that's um you know i look back to like my pa the passive immunity project we worked on and And I kind of feel like collaboration was a piece of that, and and through that collaboration, I was really able to, as the as the uh, statue or whatever that is on mm -hmm. just south of here says, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we can all see further. And I kind of feel like that's that's what that allowed me to do is I really was able to to work with with uh, giants within the the industry mm -hmm. to to move ahead, and that's that was really an amazing recognition of what could happen if you collaborate. Absolutely. So kind of on the same vein as collaboration, but maybe a little different. Um, we always like to ask about mentorship. So how has mentorship shown up in your career? And then how do you seek that now that you're here at CSU? I'm just kind of curious to know more about that. Yeah. Mentorship is, is big, maybe as big as collaboration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of um, similar. Yeah. It is. It is very similar. Uh, so, Mentorship, I think that starts, boy, back with your parents, with your family, and, and especially with mine being in the beef industry. And mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of mentorship through the veterinarians that I, that I worked with through high school, uh, college. Um, Bill Wales was, was a, definitely a big uh, mentor of mine. And um, the, yeah, it just kind of keeps going. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Frank Gehry would be another one that, that has to be on that list. And um, the, the funny thing or the, the nice thing about, about mentorship is it goes full circle as well. And so through my time at USDA, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of students, really mm -hmm. intelligent, energetic, bright kids. I shouldn't say kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Bright individuals. <laughs> and <you> and it's, <laughs> it's, it's really rewarding, even if you just have a little impact on, on what they can accomplish to see where those folks have gone. I've got people that, are, that I've worked with that, that have moved way up in USDA and academia and mm -hmm. industry and just seeing them succeed. And even if you just had a tiny part of that is, is really makes you feel good and it makes you feel like you're kind of paying back what all those mentors have provided you in the past. So I think that's a, a cyclic thing that that's nice. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's, I agree. I I hundred percent agree with you, and it's great to hear that. So now, now I think we are going to wrap up with more personal yeah, questions. These are, we're we're through all the hard ones. Now these are kind yeah, of the fun, the, more fun ones. Uh, and I I don't want you put in the spot with the first one, but like, <laughs> <laughs> what is if you could pick one? What is your favorite breed of of cow? Uh, my favorite breed of cow would have to be the brown Swiss. Brown Swiss. Yeah. I have a great son who loved that. So uh, I, I think that <laughs> all cattle have a special place, uh -huh. but brown Swiss are, are those are your favorite. favorite. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. 
Um, okay, so kind of in the same, it's about your favorite, but what's your favorite dairy product? That's an easy one. Okay. Everybody knows that. <laughs> it's ice cream. I was going to guess and, ice cream. <laughs> and I don't know if we can say brand names on here, but Bluebell Pistachio Almond is, oh, man, is my you're favorite. You're taking it home all the way. That's great. And, uh, <laughs> the, I don't know if you remember, but there were a few years ago where that the brand had a recall. Oh, sure. And um, it wasn't in the, the large size that I had. It was in the small kind of single serve ones. But I refused to throw mine away from, <laughs> oh, when no. they were recall. I said, I'll take my chances. I'm going to finish my ice cream. Because <laughs> awesome. I knew it was going to be off the market for quite a while. Oh, I'm bummer. Glad yeah. it's back. That's awesome. <laughs> Pistachio almond, you said. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll have to give that one a go. I don't think I've tried that one. Huh. But uh, I see they sell almers in the in the Ram Country Meats. And oh, there's some downstairs. That's pretty good, too. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, Ice cream go. expert. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, awesome. There's another thing that. And we know that you like a lot of sports and we were chatting before we started recording. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about your passion on, on sports and biking and running? And if you want to explain what you're telling us before we started. That's oh, yeah, cool. you were talking sure. about um, your goals around six miles. or Yeah, I'll let you talk. I just, <laughs> I'm excited to hear yeah. about it again. So, um, well, I think some of this stems from, from I've always had, I seem to have my parents have told me I always had, tend to have a lot of energy. So um, <laughs> getting out and exercising is was a good thing. But I also love to eat. Mm -hmm. And so to balance those out, I really need to make sure and <laughs> stay active, right? Yeah, of course. And um, there's only so many organized events you can sign up for that you can afford over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is nice to have kind of a, a goal, whether it's a monthly or so goal. So like the horse tooth half is coming up in a few weeks. And so that's, that's one that, that you really have to do some training for. Mm -hmm. uh, but a few years ago, I, I um, started thinking about, and I, I might have heard this somewhere, I can't remember, but the number of, uh, do the number of miles for the, for the year that we're in. So 2024, uh, try to do 2024 multi-purpose miles over the course of a year. Oh, wow. Okay. So that average is a, a little under six miles a day. And from, I set the rules, I can do whatever yeah, I want, but it's, it's your, essentially it's your deal. biking, <laughs> hiking, running, skiing, or the four things that, okay. that I tend to do the most of. And so, um, yeah, I like to do that. The, the, that's kind of keeps me motivated every day. I don't have to say, well, yeah. in, in six months, I'm going to do this activity. Mm -hmm. but, do, you, um, do you track it? Do you write it down or how do you, or just oh, yeah. can I, oh, do you, okay. <laughs> okay. I was curious. Yeah. I, it's one of my mini spreadsheets that I oh, have. Oh, that's oh, cool. Wow. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Excel so, for the win. <laughs> right. That's awesome. And you only adds a mile every year, right? Yeah, I guess so. Right? <laughs> that's right. Only a mile every year. But you know, when you go from December 31st to January 1st, that's a hard day. That's oh, a hard yeah. day. Because, yeah, you lose like 2,000 miles. But <laughs> the other thing that, I'm, awesome. that I'll just throw out there is uh, because I think it goes to kind of life lessons is in 2003, I started climbing Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks. Which oh. There's 54 of them in Colorado. Cool. And uh, along the journey of doing those, I had my daughters join me on, on some of those. Oh, cool. And I think that um, over, over time, I think that gave them the confidence that, that, you know, they can overcome tough challenges mm -hmm. and mental toughness is, is a big thing. And That's so important. I'm hoping that uh, as much as I enjoyed them, I hope that it helped build build that confidence in them that they can do anything they put their mind to. Well, now I have to ask how many. 14ers have you done? I've done all of them and I'm kind of starting back and, and repeating some. You of did them, all of them, of, even the technical ones. Well, there's none that, that require ropes. Oh, okay. Got it. There's some you can use ropes on, but okay. Those are the ones required. I was thinking of. There's some that are like more challenging, Yeah. but you've done all of them. Done all of them. The, That's the, amazing. The 14ers have gotten really busy in the last, of course, it's very popular five years. Uh, so I've kind of moved to the 13ers. Okay. In, and the 13ers are usually a little more remote, and obviously not as popular, mm -hmm. and just a little more, more solitude. Yeah. Some of those. And they're new. Yeah. So that's that's awesome. And that's amazing. And doing that with her daughter is a great way of mentorship that would just throw like she. Oh, yeah. That's a great way to having like. Having her that. experiencing that is yeah. you're mentor her by example or things like that. That's, that's pretty really cool. cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, let's see. Oh, yeah, this ties in. Okay. 
Um, what is your favorite food? We were just talking about food, and you already talked about ice cream, so I'm going to say you can't say ice cream. But what's your favorite food? <laughs> but you can say steak. <laughs> no, just because I want to hear something else. <laughs> uh, uh, my favorite food, uh, aside from ice cream, of course, of course, is probably barbecue brisket. Oh, barbecue brisket. Okay, can't go wrong. That's it's great. That's a winner. That's a winner. Yeah. 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 The okay. last one. Uh, where is your uh, favorite place to visit? You mentioned about the hiking, and but is there your a favorite place to visit that you like to go? Or then th your favorite that you have ever visit that also works. Yeah, I think the mountains in general. I tend to feel like yeah. that's where I, I feel most at home mm -hmm. is in the mountains. Uh, there are places so uh, where my family used to ranch. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandpa's ashes are spread on that ranch. And so oh, it's, cool. it's kind of a, a special place to visit. Um, but the mountains in general are yeah. cool. what I'd call home. That's awesome. Well, Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank and you. yeah, and to our listeners, as always, thank you for also joining us for another episode of the Ag Next podcast. Um, we always encourage folks to join us, join the conversation on social media. Um, be sure to check us out, agnext.colostate.edu, or follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or X. Um, or if you'd like to, you know, reach out to us uh, via email, we're always open for commentary, just agnext at colostate.edu. Um, and listeners, be sure to take a uh, peek at our um, social media in the coming weeks we're going to be posting a poll for a listener listeners pick podcast and we would love to have you help us to determine the topic um, of our of our next podcast so as always thanks for joining us on the ag next podcast where we're excited to tell you about what's next from ag next uh -huh.